Oh, now, Chad. All right, Junior Church is dismissed at this time. Get more things plugged in, plugged on, plugged out, pushed in. Good night. I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 23, familiar passage of Scripture. When you find it, I want you to stand up. We're going to read it together. This is part two of a message I began two weeks ago. Last week I preached a message, of course, on uh, 4th of July, and I'm going to get back to the subject today. This is part two of defeating Satan's lies. Now, beloved, there's not going to be any great exegesis of Scripture here, I told you. This is a family chat that I want to continue having with you. I believe it's important that we understand these principles, because this is how the devil works amongst God's people. Psalm chapter 23, let's read it together, beginning with verse number 1. Ready? Let's read. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise the Lord and amen. Our Father and our God, as we come to the table today, as we uh, feast on what you have provided for us, the spiritual nourishment from the Word of God, Father, I pray that you'd put a hedge of protection about us, but Father, I pray you'd anoint this preacher, Lord, that these godly delicacies that we're going to learn today will refute the devil's activities in our lives, we understand something about his wiles and his devices. Father, I pray you to anoint this preacher with feet of clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, several weeks ago, I told you that we're in a spiritual battle that's more real and more serious than a heart attack. And unfortunately, the battlefield of Christendom is littered with carcasses and casualties of Christian soldiers who have been slain by the devil, who have been slain by the enemy. Now, beloved, this diabolical, relentless enemy is constantly and continuously on the prowl. He's doing everything he possibly can to inundate your mind and your soul with all kinds of lies. Amen? Now, that's important that you understand that because a lot of you have said to me, Preacher, when I'm praying, all these thoughts are coming to my mind. They can't be of God because they're awful. Well, who do you think it's from? Well, I'll tell you who it's from, beloved. It's from the enemy, the diabolical enemy. And what he wants to do is get fellowship at the table that God has prepared for you. And God has not prepared this table for you in some green pasture out there, has he? He said, no, I have prepared this table for you in the presence of your enemy. You see, our enemies want to feast on the blessings, benefits, and bounties that God has given to you and I. They want to feast on this righteousness. They're going to be damned in the end, but they hope they can mix themselves among us and feast at the table with this diabolical menu that they're feeding us that God will not damn them in the end. You see, we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. The Bible says we're not to be ignorant of the wiles of the devil. The Bible says we're not to be ignorant of his demonic attacks. His attacks to deceive you. His attacks to destroy you. A lot of people don't believe in the devil today. That's the greatest lie that ever was, that he's got people to believe, amen? That he does not exist. If he doesn't exist, Jesus doesn't exist. Because who talked more about the devil than Jesus? Did Jesus lie to us? No, he didn't lie to us. And by the way, the devil's equal is not Jesus. It's Michael the archangel. See, the devil's a created being. Jesus is the eternal son of the living God. Would you say amen out there? So the devil wants to rob your soul. The devil wants to rob your faith. He wants to ravage your moral and spiritual life. And ultimately, he wants to rip and strip you of your eternal life. Why? So you'll be dead and doomed with him in the end on the day of judgment. So the devil does everything he can to try to worm his way in so he can dine at our table. Now look at verse 5, if you would. Notice what uh, the 
psalmist says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now the word table, shulhan, means a royal banquet that God's truly, that's truly fit for a king. It means that celestial meal that morally and spiritually nourishes us. It means the spiritual feast that supernaturally strengthens and sustains us as we sit at this table and we eat and devour that godly dinner that God has prepared for us. Would you say amen? And I told you this typifies the Lord's Supper and Communion, and it finds its ultimate fulfillment in the marriage feast of the Lamb. That messianic banquet that someday we're going to sit in the eternal kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to serve us. Would you say amen out there? And so, but, uh, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this. Is this table God set is only for God's people. And Satan wants to worm his way in. But listen to me. God is the divine host of this table, not the devil. Amen? Now, I've told you, beloved, there's five broad categories categories where Satan, uh, we can kind of sum this up. So I'm going to kind of philosophize as I go along here instead of doing uh, an exegesis. But I want you to remember this. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The Bible says that God always causes us to triumph in Christ. In Isaiah 54, 17, the Bible says that no weapon that is formed against you shall ever prosper. Would you say amen? Now the first lie we saw was Satan's lies of deception. In other words, if you've heard recently that it's better at another table, then you can be certain that Satan is sitting at your table and he's whispering in your ears. In other words, he tries to tell you that the table of the world is better than God's table. He tries to tell you that the table of running with the devil's crowd is better than God's table. He tries to tell you that the table of materialism or pleasure or partying or living without moral and spiritual restraint. Some code of ethics in this world is better than God's table. But don't you ever listen to him. He's a liar, Jesus said, and the truth is not in him. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, that's not the table you want to sit down and, uh, and eat at. Because pretty soon he's going to convince you that God is not so good, and he's going to try to convince you that God shows favoritism, but he doesn't show it with you. And he's going to try to show you that God truly blesses everybody, but he doesn't bless you, you see, because he's really against you. Now, that's the lies that the devil whispers. And, beloved, you know the Scripture teaches, if I pull back the veil right now, we would see in that spiritual dimension more demons and angels than your mind could ever conceive, and it would stun you. So he gives us these satanic lies, this satanic deception, beloved. But you listen to me now. We don't have to listen to those lies. You see, God says, you eat at my table, and you eat what I give you, and you listen to what I have to say to you. Amen? Because any other table is the doctrine of demons. That's what it says in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and give heed to what? Doctrines of demons. Demons are real. In fact, beloved, you know who believes in demons probably more than any other profession? Psychiatrists. Because they say they see things happen go far beyond anything that could be human or natural. Not psychologists. They can't get two of them to agree on anything. None of them know their right hand from their left, you ask me. So that was point number one. Satan's lies, beloved. The lies of deception that he gives us. And don't you ever listen to them because he is a master deceiver. Number two, I taught you Satan's lies of damnation. The Lord Jesus Christ promises that he'd give eternal life to all those who believe on him and keep on believing on him and that he would no wise cast them out. But what Satan wants to do is get us to focus on our moral and spiritual imperfections. We're not perfect yet, are we? But we are perfect in our position standing with God. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, God sees us in Christ. And so therefore, beloved, we are perfect in that manner. Now remember, Jesus said that the devil comes, but not for to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. I've come to give you more abundant physical life, more abundant spiritual life, and blessed be God, more abundant eternal life. Would you say amen? And so, beloved, you can see that we're in a real spiritual battle. I'm going to just kind of move right along here because I want to finish up what I started. 
But beloved, what I want you to know is this, because we talked a lot about the valley of the shadow of death in my last message. But Jesus teaches us here that when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that he escorts us as our chaperone, doesn't he? You're not alone. He goes through it with you. But what the devil tries to do is make you unaware of that. He doesn't want you to be mindful of that truth. And you'll see why as I go along. Because he wants you to believe that you're a nobody. He wants you to believe that things are hopeless, beloved. But listen to me, the Bible says you're a real somebody. Would you say amen? Jesus loves in you, and he died for you, and he's going to bring you into his heaven. So you're a real somebody with God. A God never would have bankrupted heaven, given his only begotten son to die for you. I want to begin with point number three here, Satan's lie of denigration. Satan's lie, have you seen Satan's lies of deception? Satan's lies of damnation? And I want you to see number three, Satan's lie of denigration. Satan always tries to make you feel, beloved, like you have no value before God. Like you're worthless. Now, we've got to be really careful about this because Scripture calls us to be humble. But listen to me, beloved. It has been well said before that this, that humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. You hear that? Humility is not thinking of uh, less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. The Bible says in James 4, 6, that God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Would you say amen? But some of us are so focused on ourselves. And that's what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to turn inward. Not look upward, but to turn inward with all of the problems and all of the hurts and all of the things that are going on uh, in our life. You see, we easily get these things confused about thinking of ourselves uh, less uh, or thinking of ourselves even more, beloved. And that's not humility I've taught you. But we get these things confused by thinking it honors God for think less of ourselves. But beloved, beloved, that could never be farther from the truth. You listen to me. Maybe someone told, me, told you that you'll never amount to anything. I've had people say that to me remember when I was young. You know what that did with me, though? It irritated me, so I did everything I could to show them they were wrong. <laughs> it was like, how do you say in French? How did Clouseau say it? A challenge. <laughs> Inspector Clouseau, remember? A challenge. Now, maybe, beloved... A spouse walked away or a parent bailed on you as a child. Or maybe the right man or woman you've longed for never walked through the door. Or maybe you're always wished uh, as a child that you looked like someone else, your friend. Maybe you had their physique or you had their gifts or you had a muscle like a soggy Cheerio like Pastor Joel. Maybe that was it, beloved. Or, beloved, maybe a dump truck, a load of guilt backed into your story and at some point unloaded a big pile of blame and shame on you making you beat yourself up all the time. As a pastor, I've counseled multitudes of people over the years of people that have said that to me. I'm blaming myself. I'm so ashamed, pastor. I'm embarrassed. I feel so guilty, pastor. What do I do? What you do is you listen to what I have to say. But here's the thing you should know, beloved. That sour note tune you're always singing to yourself, that you're not good enough, that you're Nobody, that, uh, that you're a worthless, unimportant person, was composed in the pit of hell, and it even smells like smoke. God would never, ever say that to you. Would you say amen? Hey, listen to me now. You were made in his image and his likeness. You're the crowning work of God's creation. Would you say amen out there? So stop humming it to yourself, beloved, because it's crippling you. Stop hobbling this tune to yourself because it's debilitating and it's paralyzing you. Stop saying that to yourself, beloved. Why? Because it's suffocating you and depressing you, beloved. So stop it. Cut it out. Because this denigrating dirge didn't come from God, the good shepherd. He came from the gangster, the old slew foot himself, to humiliate you. The fact is God loves all mankind. Even the worst sinner in the world, Jesus came to die for that sinner, didn't he? Now, for sure, he'll die in hell if he doesn't repent, but he's done everything he can to be able to save that man. So you can be assured that when Satan is whispering at your ear 
and he's sitting at your table, and he's telling you you're nothing, you're nobody, trying to depress you, trying to get you all upset, you can be sure that that wasn't Jesus. Beloved, listen to me. If you were the last person on this earth, or the only person on this earth, <clears throat> Jesus Christ would have still come and died for you, to redeem you. Imagine that, a world of one, Jesus still would have come down so you didn't have to go to hell. You know, I, I was talking to a preacher several weeks ago, and he said, we don't like to talk about hell in our church. I said, I don't either, but the fact is, Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody. Hell is part of the gospel message. The, the word gospel, evangelion in the Greek, means the good news. Well, if there's good news, there's bad news. Amen? What's the bad news? You're damned. You're born separated from God because of Adam's sin and your own. But the good news, if you come to Christ, He forgives you and He reconciles you with God. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, this denigrating lie Satan whispered in your ear at the table isn't a reflection of real, true, godly humility. It's the devil's deviant club he tries to beat you over the head with to make you senseless regarding just how inexplic inexplicably priceless, <laughs> that's the word I want, and presses you out of God. Why else would God send his only begotten son to redeem you? I'll tell you why. Because he infinite loved, infinitely loved you, that's why. But why else would God not only give you the Holy Spirit, but personally live inside of you via the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you why. Because he infinitely loved you. That's why. Amen. But why else would God give you the free gift of eternal life? God's life. No one else can give you this. No doctor in the world. No medication in the world. Nobody can give you this. This is God's life in a new, glorified, immortal body living in the eternal kingdom of God forever and ever and ever ad infinitum. I'll tell you why, because he infinitely loves you and you and you and you and you. He loves everybody. But he's also a just and he's a holy God. Amen? Amen. So, beloved, that's how much you mean to God. That's how much you're worth to God. That's how much you're valued by God. So when Satan whispers this lie to you, that you're worthless, that you're useless, that you're nothing, you're nothingness, don't you ever believe it? Why? Because if you do believe it, now you're calling God a liar. Because God has revealed to you how much he's loved you. Either he told the truth or he lied to you. You decide. And beloved, after seeing all that God is giving to you, and also the eternal investment he has in you, in the person and work of his Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Satan's lie of degradation says you'll never have what it takes to serve the Lord. And Satan's lie of degradation says you're not good enough to ever be called a Christian. And Satan's lie of degradation said there's no way you're truly a part of God's flock. But oh, beloved, in John 10, 11, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And he did on the cross at Calvary. Would you say amen? Meaning that if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are indeed one of his little sheepies. You're a little sheepy here this morning. Now, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, you just had known from here up, he's, you're not a little sheepy. You're a goat. But God says, I can make you a sheepy if you repent of your sin and come to me. Amen? So you hear me now, beloved, because God says, I am the good shepherd. I've given my life for you. Meaning if you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, beloved, then you're part of the flock of God. Would you say amen out there? You hear me now. Jesus, as the good shepherd, put it all on the line for you and I. Not just some of it. All of it. And you know, when he went to the cross and was wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says he wept with bitter tears. His soul was nigh unto death. You know why, beloved, I believe one of the reasons? Because he had to believe the scriptures that said that he would resurrect again and live forever and ever. Just like you and I have to believe it. And the Bible says he believed so much that God sent an angel to strengthen him. And guess what? Bless God, he did resurrect. And he conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. And so we had to believe through faith just like you and I have to do. So push yourself away from the table and the devil tries to feed you this meal of lies 
and eat at the table of the Good Shepherd. Listen to what he has to say. Read his book. Internalize those truths, those principles that he's given to you. Make them, beloved, listen to me now, they're more real than anything else in this world. You know, as a minister for all these years, over four decades now, I've never had one person that I buried say to me, you know what, I wish I could take my house with me. I wish all that money that I saved and all my 401ks and all of the jewels that I have, I wish I could take it with me. You know, Paul said to me, Pastor, am I assured of heaven? Am I going to glory, go to glory? I did accept these and I comfort them and uh, encourage them, letting them know that they're a Christian, that they're saved, their sins have been washed in the blood. And the next person they're going to see when they close their eyes is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You know, when you're blind from birth, and you get saved, the first person you ever see in your life is the Lord Jesus at death. Amen? Death becomes that morbid vehicle that leads us to the grave, through the grave, up into God. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, that's Satan's lies of deception, Satan's lies of damnation, Satan's lies of denigration. Number four, Satan's lies of desolation. Satan's lies of desolation. I want you to pay close attention to this. Because you can have a million people around you and still feel all alone. Amen? I do. As a pastor, I'll tell you right now. I've got nobody I can really talk to. And I'm just letting you, letting you know that. Because, you know, beloved, uh, as a pastor does that, what happens is that undermine your own authority, credibility, and also people have a tendency, if you've told them something in private, it'll come back and bite you. So I've seen it's best just to go out and talk with the Lord and let him hear me and strengthen me. And then God sovereignly, providentially, sends people who don't even know what they're doing come and they minister to me, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Satan's lie of desolation. The devil knows that if he can separate you, if he can isolate you away from the good shepherd's flock, beloved, then he can more easily deceive and destroy you. When you take a bunch of coal in a coal stove, I used to heat my house with a coal stove, and you take a hot of coal and you pour it and you make a big pile of it. And when all of the coals are touching one another, they're burning red hot. Amen? But I'm, I'm burning. I was set to draft and that would be a 12-hour burn. I only had to change my coal stove twice a day. But if I took one coal away from all those other coals and I set it aside, all of a sudden a glimmer in it started flickering. It started cooling off. And eventually it would burn out. That's what the devil wants to happen to you. Beloved, you hear me now? Satan tries to get you to think that it's just you, you or me against the world. Doesn't he do that? Satan tries to get you to believe that uh, the lie that everybody is against you. He tries to get you to or convince you that everybody hates you and you feel all alone in the spiritual battle. Many times people said, I know people don't like me at church, Pastor Joe. Oh, beloved, that's not the Holy Ghost that says that. Hey, listen to me. You know, I'm the preacher. People don't like me at church. <laughs> so you got it all right. <laughs> I always tell them, you want to hit me, you got to wait in line, and it's a long one. He tries, Satan tries to get you to believe, beloved, that uh, all these mind games that he's playing with you make you feel like everybody at church hates you and everybody at your job hates you and everybody you sit at the table with hates you. And he diabolically gives you myopic vision to make you paranoid and feel like nobody wants anything to do with you because they greatly despise and they loathe you. Isn't that what he whispers in our ears? Everybody despises me. Beloved, the devil tries to make you feel like your church, your pastors, your elders, your deacons despise you, your parents despise you. If you're going to school, your professors despise you. They're not giving you the type of grades you think you should be getting. And beloved, the devil tries to make you feel like your family and your friends despise you. Maybe your colleagues and your neighbors and even the waiter spit in your soup. You see, beloved, that's the kind of attitude that we have, and that's what Satan wants us to have, that pessimistic, negative attitude. So listen to me now. This is the deviant voice of, the, of illogical fear, and this is the deviant voice of suspicion and paranoia, and this is the deviant voice of doubt, distrust, and cynicism that's meant 
to drive you away from all these folks, beloved. The very people you need to help you and encourage you and support you. He's trying to ruin your support system around you. Drive you away so you'll burn out like that coal that I told you about. He wants to put a wedge of separation between you, an irreparable wedge, so you can't get back together. You turn on your best friend. I know they're saying that about me. But love, you tell, you listen to me now. You hear me. Good friends are hard to find. I don't know about you, but if you've got a good friend, don't cast them off. You listen to me. As a friend, you take the good, bad, and the ugly. Amen? A good friend should be able to dress you down, and even if you agree, you can agree to disagree and still be friends. But so many people act like little spoiled children. You said that. You said, no. They snap their feet, and they discard their friends. You know what? The Marine Corps, if you ever did that, they chuck you or they throw a grenade at you. Their own men would do that to you. What kind of friend is that? And a few things go wrong and all of a sudden you get so upset you can't do it. Get over it and grow up and become a man and a woman. Would you say amen out there? And so Satan wants to take that support system away from you, beloved. And what he wants to do is get you to feel utterly lost in loneliness and in solitude. He wants you lost in that isolation or that paranoia that you may be in. So you're always arguing with yourself. You're having these internal arguments in your imagination and in your heart and in your soul, arguing with yourself over and over again. I know someone saying this about me. I can tell the way they looked at me. You see, beloved, that's why it's a spiritual battle, isn't it? You see, certainly there are subtler forms of this lie, and I'm not going to go into all of them because we don't have time. The enemy is great at sowing seeds of doubt at your table and working to undermine your confidence about what's true and about what's false in your life. In other words, he's a master at getting folks to think that everybody's gossiping and spreading rumors about them, talking trash about them behind their back. Now, beloved, I've taught you the battlefield is your heart and your mind. That's the battlefield, amen? And he'll want you to run wild with all kinds of these negative thoughts. Like, I don't have any friends anymore. Like, nobody really likes me anymore. Like, no one will ever invite me anywhere. What's the real truth? Well, sure, it's possible, but highly probable, by the way, that somebody really hates you and utterly detests you. You know, there's a lot of people that get mad at me, but I don't think anybody really utterly hates me or detests me, beloved, because I've never done anything to anyone for them to do that. But the devil tries to make you feel that way. And it's a lie. Remember, he's the master of lies. He's the father of lies, Jesus said. And it's not likely that everybody is against you, ladies and gentlemen. What's more likely, uh, if you're hearing that lie, is that somewhere in the past you develop a defensive posture, an untrusting nature, and now sadly it becomes your default position and your wrong thinking. You're always in that mode. Now your defensive walls are always up on the inside. You know exactly what I'm saying, don't you? Once that wall goes up, you can't hear anything. You're so busy thinking about what you're going to say, how you're going to retaliate, that you can't hear a word that this person is saying, and if it's true or not. Let me tell you something. The best counsel you ever get in your life sometimes is from your enemy. They'll tell you exactly what you need to hear. You need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, was that true? Because a lot of times your best friends tell you only what you need to hear. I mean, want to hear, not need to hear. They'll just tell you what you want to hear. They don't want to upset you. And that's not real love or real friendship, is it? You see, beloved, now you've always got your fists clenched and you're ready to strike. And now, beloved, you have... Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, Lord? Give it to me. Now you have that attitude like... There's no one I can, nothing I can say to anyone that they will come along and help me. I'm all alone. I'm all alone in this. I know that I'm married, but I'm all alone. I know that there's people that say that they love me, but I'm all alone. And so you feel like the walls are closing in on you, don't you? You see, beloved, Satan knows that because people may have hurt you in the past, that to protect yourself, to protect your feelings, you're not going to ever let people get close to you again. And so you put your hand on it and you say, that's as far as you're going to get to me. I want you to look, if you would, please, at verse 2b and 3a. 
He says, He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. The truth is, is that you need to let the Good Shepherd lead you by the still waters. Now, what does He mean by that? By the still waters, beloved, every one of us has gone down to a pond sometime and we've seen the water just calm as could be still, not even a ripple, amen? So it's a euphemism for calming, calming of your mind, calming of your spirit with his peace, with his tranquility, beloved. In other words, what he's saying here is be like a little kid, play follow the leader with the good shepherd, amen? He's not going to lead you to troubled waters. He's not going to lead you into these lies. He's not going to lead you to being upset. He's going to lead you into calmness, into tranquility, beside those still waters, beloved. So let your imagination run wild, because if it does, you become paranoid, and you become focused on yourself. Me, 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 I, I, I. The Apostle Paul told the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, he said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, for the pulling down of strongholds. Listen casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought, every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Would you say amen? Casting down those imaginations, not entertaining them, not believing them, not rolling them over in your mind again and again, recognizing, being spiritual enough to realize that this is of the devil. You need to cast it down. These imaginations. Amen? You see, beloved, I want you to notice that the Good Shepherd in this text doesn't drive you to these green pastures. He doesn't drive you to the paths of righteousness against your will. But rather, it says that He leads you there to willfully follow Him. He wants you to make up your mind, I'm going to follow you to this state, this place, O God, where you can supernaturally calm my fears and you can heal my loneliness. And I'm going to let you do it. Because no matter what I feel, I know that my feelings are wrong because of what you said in your word that is never wrong. Would you say amen? Amen. And so, beloved, you can see where faith enters into the picture. Also, beloved, you must seek and let him restore. Notice what he says here, restoreth your soul. That's a verb. That's the Hebrew word shub. That is supernatural revive, renew, refresh your soul from all that inner trauma and all that inner turmoil. You hear me now? The valley of the shadow of death is in and of itself, no doubt about it, a hard place. And it's a desolate place, beloved. It's an awful place to be in. And yet the Bible tells us that we're all going to go through that. But you know what? We'll go through it, and we'll come out the other end. Amen? I taught you that already in the first message. You may want to get that. But God is walking there with you, beloved. He's going to lead you uh, through that. And the good shepherd does that with his sheep. He's out in the front leading, and the sheep are following him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me in John chapter 10. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, when you start following the good shepherd, then you can stop worrying about managing all the outcomes in your life. And then you can stop looking over your shoulder in suspicion like you're doing right now. And then you can uh, uh, take the boxing gloves off and rest in the fact that the good shepherd, hear me now, has got your back. Any military person will tell you that's in combat, one of the most important, two of the most important men you can have is the point man, who's always looking out for booby traps, looking out for the enemy. He's probably 100 feet in front of everybody else. And then a hundred feet behind you is Tailgun Charlie. Tailgun Charlie is watching you six. He's watching your back, making sure that the enemy's not now trailing you to try to ambush you. So God is saying, look, and I'm not only your point, man, but I've got you six. I've got your back. So what have we learned so far? Number one, Satan's lies of deception. Number two, Satan's lies of damnation. Number three, Satan's lie of denigration. Number four, Satan's lies of desolation. I want to give you the fifth one. Number five, Satan's lie of desperation. You know, beloved, desperate people do desperate things that almost always backfires and gets them in trouble. Pastor, I didn't know what to do. I just did it. It just came automatically over me, and I got myself in a hole. How do I get out of it? 
You see, beloved, desperation. Satan wants you to believe that there's no way out. And this is the classic and ultimate lie of the enemy, beloved, that combines several of the lies that I've already addressed. Because he wants you to wallow in despair and despondency. And Satan convinces you that there's nowhere for you to turn now, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And he wants you to lose all hope and help of deliverance and escape from that painful and that pressing problem you're in. So you think there's no way forward, that there's no chance that you'll ever get out of this. There's no scenario, if you will, that you can envision in your mind you're ever going to be free and happy. Remember, when you were first saved, you felt free and happy, delivered. But somewhere along the way, you compromised and you got entrapped. And that's why you're at where you are right now. We need to go back and do our first works, our first love. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible teaches us in the book of the Revelation to the seven churches? You see, beloved, remember how happy you were when you first got saved. Satan knows that the prison of desperation and despair in your heart and your mind can so depress you and so discourage you that you'll stop praying. What's the use? I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed. Nothing's changed. He wants you to stop hoping, ladies and gentlemen. He wants you to stop trying. He wants you to stop trusting that the Good Shepherd will ever come to rescue you and supernaturally deliver you. And like a ticker tape running relentlessly across the screen of your mind, all you vividly now see is the painful consequences of your bad decisions. And all you vividly now see are the awful after effects of your sinful actions. And all you vividly now see are things tightly closing in around you from all directions, and you feel trapped, just like a bird in the cage. As the Bible talks about that snare that comes upon the bird. He goes under that little cage to get some bread, and you pull the string, and he's caught. Amen? And so you've lost hope, and a lot of people lose their testimony, lose their witness, their reputation. And you see, beloved, your last card... You start thinking, you know what, I've lost everything. I'm probably going to lose my job too. I've seen people go from here, take quantum leaps in their negative thoughts, all the way to something that hasn't even happened yet, or no one's intimated it's going to happen. I know I'm going to lose my job, Pastor. Well, we're talking about what's going on in the family. Why are you going to lose your job? Well, I just know. They're all linked together. I can see the way that that's working. (laughs) And they get themselves all worked up in a tither. You see, beloved... You feel like you can't go back to church. A lot of people feel like I can't trust family or friends for help. I can't trust anyone. And you played your last card. And so, beloved, this infernal lie of hopeless desperation that Satan uses tries to oppress you and depress you with. But mind you, beloved, listen to me now. I know it's an old saying, but it's true. Tough times don't last. Tough people do. You've got to have rhino skin, leather, toughen up. That's why we're in the spiritual battle, so we can learn how to fight it, so we can be toughened up. Not so sensitive that we're torn apart, fall apart. And the least little, oh, they said that about me. (laughs) You know what I say when they say that to me, honestly? I say, you don't know the half of it. Whether it's true or not, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> and I just move on, go my merry little way. You know, First Peter 5, 7, Peter said, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Casting. Notice he didn't say casted. It's a verb. Present tense verb. Casting. This is my care of my job. This is the care of that problem I have. You're casting it upon him who is the good shepherd, who is the sovereign Lord God of the universe. You're casting upon him. You see, Satan wants you to lose all hope. I was thinking about the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Paul, his missionary jersey, beloved, literally went through hell on earth for the Lord Jesus. But he says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. Amen? Sure, all these bad things are happening to us, but you know what? The Lord's always there to lift us out of it. You see, all of us, everybody in this room, those watching by television, those who get these tapes, 
have been through enough storms in our life to know the harsh reality of at least some of these things I've been talking about. Amen? So I'm not going to pretend following the advice I'm giving you is an easy cakewalk, beloved. Just that there is hope and help with the Lord. And that is what you've got to hide and believe in your heart. If you feel like you're surrounded, there's no way out, I've got game-changing news for you, beloved. You are surrounded. But listen to me. But not just with the troubles, but also with God's person, God's power, God's promises, God's angels. They are all around you also. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto them that should be heirs of salvation? Are they not? Sent forth by God, angels all around us. And the same writer, in chapter 13, verse 2, he says, not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I've had that happen in my life. Someone who I thought was a person came along and helped me. As they walked away, they walked into another dimension. God sent an angel. An angel unawares. And so, Satan wants you to believe that this isn't true. See, he wants you to uh, know that his demons are powerful, but the angels aren't as powerful as his demons are. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Amen? So, beloved, things are really better than you think. Sure, it may be true the circumstances are fast closing in on you. And sure, it may be true that the enemies have taken a position in the night of your life. And it might be true that your whole world is surrounded by threats and accusations and persecutors and hate. But here's the thing. That's only half the story. Sure, the enemy wants you to believe you're doomed. And he wants you to believe there's nowhere out. But the Holy Spirit of the living God is always interceding for you. He's saying something like this in Romans 8, 26. Lord, open their spiritual eyes like you did Elisha's servant. And when he looked out, he said, we're surrounded by the Syrians. And God, Elijah said, Lord, open their eyes. And when he did, he saw angels and chariots of fire all around them. And he said, there's more with us than against us. He was from Tennessee. More with us than against us. Lord, open their eyes, their eyes of faith. And let them see that there's more that is against them than thou are against you. Let them see with the eyes of faith. And that you have everyone and everything that's surrounding them surrounded. <laughs> surrounded by your supernatural power. Surrounded by your supernatural promises and your providence. Surrounded by your angels and that there's nothing impossible for you to miraculously do in any, or in any trial or difficulty or trouble that you may be in in your life. Amen? Now I want you to look at verse number 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Notice that when you go through the valley of the shadow of death like this, God's divine presence is what he's teaching us here. His protection is constantly and continuously with you, and that you're never alone. Oh, that we'd believe and beware of this truth. But note the twofold promise that the good shepherd gives us here one the divine courage look what he says in verse 4b i will fear no evil why for thou art with me that is the good shepherd's divine presence is with you hey do you believe that do you really believe that are you aware of his presence when you're in the valley of the shadow of death i hope you can say amen and notice the words no evil ra means that if you believe and trust in the good shepherd's promise here then he'll supernaturally give you the courage and the bravery to fear no injury, to fear no misery, to fear no adversity, to fear no uh, calamity, beloved. For 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given you the spirit of fear, has he, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you face the valley of the shadow of death now with valor. You know, death isn't the end, it's the beginning. I don't fear dying. I feel like going through hell before I die might be the thing you want to fear, right? <laughs> My dad used to say to me, Hawk, <laughs> dying's easy, living's hard. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? Dying's easy, living's hard. So not only does he give us divine courage, but notice the divine comfort. Look at verse 4c. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's talking about the good shepherd's crook. 
It serves two functions. It makes the sheep aware of the good shepherd's, number one, divine protection, beloved, to defend them from all evil and enemy attacks. The shepherd would have that crook, and if a, a tiger or a lion or a wolf or whatever it may come or a, some kind of cat, he beat them off with that crook. And also divine comfort, that the good shepherd's crook always, beloved, he's always right there to providentially oversee and guide every aspect of your life. Did you ever think about this? That the good shepherd is also the man of sorrows. And he knows how to meet, treat, and defeat every sorrow of the human heart. Beloved, bless God, he's even defeated death through the resurrection already. Would you say amen? And so haven't you if you believed in Jesus. Now, Satan doesn't want you to know any of this. He doesn't want you to know these things that I've taught you, beloved. And he's always trying to hide them from you so you don't have victory over him. Now, I'm going to show you with my sixth point, and I'll finish on time. Satan's lies defeated. How do we go about defeating him? Well, beloved, how do we get the victory over all of these five categories of lies by the devil in our life? We do it in a fourfold way. Number one. Rebuke him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who defeated him on the cross. When he attacks, beloved, do what Michael the archangel did in Jude 119 when they contended over the body of Moses. The devil wanted to steal the body of Moses to get the children of Israel to fall into idolatry to worship Moses. And what did Michael the archangel say? The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. All the way back in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Don't ever say, I rebuke thee, O Satan, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because when you're saying that, beloved, you're trying to add a little bit there, you know, maybe he'll believe me. Uh, Beloved, you've got no authority. No authority except in Christ. The Lord rebuked thee. He's the one that created you, Satan. He's the one that defeated you at the cross. And he's the one that's going to damn you in the day of judgment. The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Amen. So, beloved, you need to rebuke him. Number two, you need to resist him. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Anthistami is the word resist, and it means to constantly defy him, oppose him, stand against him. You see, beloved, the Bible says, having done all, we're to stand, we're to stand against the wiles of the devil, amen? Not back down, we're to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to be able to defeat him. And so, beloved, Don't give in or fall for his lies. Resist him when he's whispering these things into your ear. I resist you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Not rebuke you, I resist you. I know that he defeated you at the cross. You know, Colossians 2.14, it says, Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, on the cross, Jesus defeated Satan and all the demons in the universe. And he did it openly before the universe. That all of the good angels and all the... Uh, the souls of the faithfully martyred and departed in heaven can see it. Amen. Number three, remind him. Remind him of what? The terror he's brought into your life? No. Remind him of his eternal fate in the lake of fire of the day of judgment. <laughs> I know where you're going. You see, the Lord Jesus died for me, but not for you. The Lord didn't die for you, Satan. He didn't die for your demons. He didn't die for the third of those angels that followed you. Why? Because you lived in close proximity to God and you saw God. Therefore, it doesn't require faith for you to believe in God like it does with us. So I believe in him, see? He didn't die for you. You're going to hell, the lake of fire, which is the second death. Fight! Fight the good fight of faith, the Bible says. Lay hold on eternal life, 1 Timothy 6.12. Don't give in like some coward. So what do we do? We rebuke him. So what do we do? We resist him. So what do we do? We remind him. And lastly, what do we do? We remove him from our table. (laughs) Beloved, listen to me now. Don't ever invite him to come back once you get the victory over this. I'm going to start entertaining this bad thought again. And I know that I shouldn't everything like that, but I feel like the Holy Spirit's leading me. No, he's not leading you, beloved. Your unholy spirit is leading. Don't invite the devil back. So how do we defeat Satan's lies? Rebuke him. How do we do it? We resist him. 
How do we do it? We remind him. How do we do it? Remove him. This is how you win the spiritual battle for your heart and mind over the devil's lies. Let me give you one more text, if I may. 1 Timothy 3.8, the Bible says that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did you hear that? Jesus was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Is he doing that in your life? You say, no, Pastor, and start claiming his promises. Stop believing him. Stop doing what I'm telling you right here, and you'll have victory over Satan's lies. Let's go to the throne of grace.